morning. <laughs> Very good. My name is Mike Lake, and a proud member of the advisory board for the Smart Cities Expo and World Congress, and the president and CEO of Leading Cities, an international organization of cities exchanging best practices and ideas around the world. Today, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Uh, Parag Khanna has, has really lived a remarkable life. We've had a few minutes uh, prior to, to this morning to, to get to know each other. And as impressed as I was uh, with his uh, professional life, uh, the individual is even more impressive. His commitment to cities is something that I think everybody in this room will appreciate. He, at such a, a young age, has, has forged his path in the world. He has created um, a, almost an empire of, of information, which he shares with us uh, on a regular basis. You know, he's a, a best-selling author. He was cited as Esquire's top 75 most influential people in the 21st century. And it is our great honor to have him here today to talk about the future of globalization, how it affects all of us. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Parag Khanna. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, for that very uh, generous introduction. I, I love your term, empire of information. I've never heard that before in my life, and I'm going to use it. Uh, I will footnote you at some point. Um, I'm very, very honored to be here today. Uh, this is certainly one of the most, if not the most, you know, respected event uh, in, in the field of thinking about cities and smart cities, and it's my, my first time here, but not my first time in, in Barcelona, uh, a city that clearly has been at the center of attention internationally for a lot of reasons that I'm going to talk about towards the end. I'll save the politics for a little bit later, uh, you know, when we get really messy in the conversation. Uh, but first, let me point out that you know, the, the topic today is the future of globalization, uh, which immediately doesn't sound like it's about cities. But everything else here in this, in, this, uh, in this convention is about cities. But globalization is, in fact, the history of cities and their diplomacy and their interactions with each other. When some people say urbanization is the meme of the 21st century, yes, it is in a demographic sense. But the role of cities in the world is not a new story. It is a 5,000-year-old story. The origins of diplomacy go back to Mesopotamian cities and their relations with the cities of Anatolia and the cities of Egypt. So we are here to not just focus on the 21st century, but actually, at least for my purposes, to relay a little bit of the history of why we should be so confident as to why the 21st century will be the century of cities. The interesting thing about the conversations about globalization uh, is that people have argued for the last decade that this globalization that I think is just taking off because of the role of cities, some people believe is coming to an end. And I'll give you a few examples. In the last 10 years, three times we've heard people say that globalization would reverse or retrench, would meet a demise. Why? Well, 9-11 was uh, perhaps a good reason for concern about uh, you know, 13 years ago uh, with the tragic events in New York and Washington, D.C., people said there was no more trust between East and West. How, would we, how, how could globalization continue with such a lack of, of understanding across cultures? But indeed, globalization continued. Uh, global trade went up. There was a commodities uh, boom. We, call it, we, we now refer to that uh, last decade as the super cycle, in fact, in the global economy. So globalization did not end because of 9-11. Then we have the collapse of the World Trade Organization's Doha round. People have argued for some time, and certainly during the 2008, 2009 period, uh, or even prior, that because the Doha round of global trade negotiations did not yield a universal uh, uh, free trade agreement, that world trade would collapse, the world would fragment, and so forth. But of course, that has not happened either. Right. Global trade continues to flourish. We have a range of bilateral, regional, interregional, multilateral agreements. You've heard of uh, the APEC uh, meeting that just happened in Beijing last week, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Transatlantic, uh, uh, the Trans 
Atlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and so forth, all of these are being negotiated. World trade is not uh, going to decline because of the collapse of one round of negotiations. Then the financial crisis. I'm sure you all remember those conversations. This is the end of globalization. We will have no more financial system. The global economy will grind to a halt. You all heard this. This was what you heard on BBC, CNBC, whatever channel you're watching. But of course, globalization did take a hit with the financial crisis, but in fact, by almost every single indicator, including financial ones, globalization has returned to, if not exceeded, those levels from 2007, 2008. And now there's yet more arguments that relate to slowing global growth, the rise of state capitalism run by governments, particularly in Asia, or uh, the near-shoring of, uh, of uh, production due to uh, labor automation, technology, cheap energy in the United States. Every day someone has a new reason to argue that globalization is in trouble and globalization is going to end. So I wanted to put that all to rest in this uh, conversation and, and point out that globalization is a 60,000 year old process. It is not something that we turn on and off like a switch. And it is something deeply, deeply rooted in what we're here to talk about today, which is, which is cities. So let me go back, not 60,000 years, uh, not even the 5,000 years. Let's fast forward a little bit because we don't have a lot of time. Let's just talk about at least the last 1,000 years. Talk about the most recent five phases of globalization. And each of these phases really is a phase that is about uh, cities and about imperial capitals. This phase one, the, Mar the, the, uh, the Silk Road phase, we could also call it the Venetian phase, the Marco Polo phase, the phase in which European and Arab explorers set forth across from Europe through across the Silk Road to the Middle East and South Asia to China and back, creating the world's first transcontinental trading system. And indeed, that medieval age was the age of city-states. That was when city-states were the most powerful units in the world. The, the, the empires that Europe built at the time were centered on very, very crucial uh, uh, cities, uh, such as Venice. The second phase, the colonial phase, we could even, uh, since we're here in Spain, we could call it this, the Sevilla phase of globalization, right? Or the Lisboa phase, the phase in which the Portuguese and Spanish empires and subsequently also the Dutch uh, uh, crossed the world in taking advantage of maritime navigational technologies to cross the Atlantic, to round the Cape of Africa, to establish uh, international colonies. And here we had an expansion of the global economy because of the capital, uh, the financial capability of cities, their willingness to finance expeditions and the technologies available to them to expand globalization outward. A third phase we might call the London or New York phase of globalization, right? The Industrial Revolution, the technologies such as the steamship, the railway, industrial production, all of these things also gave rise uh, to, uh, to a new intensity of technologies and the ability to uh, expand the global economy, but centered obviously on the cities that dominated the industrial technologies of the age. The fourth phase, maybe we would call it the, the Detroit phase, uh, in which um, uh, mass manufacturing, global supply chains, uh, and also some bit of outsourcing managed to bring what we now call emerging markets into the world uh, economic picture. This was, of course, constrained uh, by the Cold War, but with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we've now had the expansion of industrial production all over the world. So this is the Detroit phase, the Rhineland phase, the Seoul, Korea phase, the Tokyo phase, whatever you want to call it, the centers of, uh, of world economic production. So that brings us actually to the present, to that point in time where people are saying, uh-oh, globalization is in trouble. But maybe they're forgetting that globalization, again, is this combination of the capital that is concentrated in cities, the new technologies, and the new markets available. So whereas some people say globalization may be reversing or in decline, I see the beginning of a fifth phase over the last thousand years that is just beginning. Because as you may all know, those phones that you have all taken out and are taking pictures with right now, um, you didn't have those even 20 years ago. So technological phases, last time I checked, last a little bit longer than 20 years, right? And the technologies that we have in our hands, the technologies uh, that are so portable and mobile and the costs are coming down, the technologies that if you walk into through the... Um, 
through the exposition pavilion here you see on display, those are just beginning to spread all over the world. Globalization is actually just beginning to completely encompass the entire world economy because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, because of the spread of capitalism and the integration of all of these markets and regions. When we had conversations about globalization and the world economy 15, 20 years ago, people forgot to talk about Africa and Latin America. Which company represented here today has a boardroom meeting that does not talk about the role of these frontier markets and emerging markets in their strategies. No one. So we're actually just entering what I call this phase of, um, of total globalization. Again, it's the marriage of new technologies, capital, the ambition of cities, the trade networks, and so forth that's making this, uh, that's making this possible. Now, this has had a big impact on geopolitics. 25 years ago, uh, uh, celebrated just a couple of weeks ago, was the 25th anniversary of the, the collapse of the, the Berlin Wall. And at the time, no one could imagine what alternate map of power the world would have. Right? People said, well, China is uh, rising, but it's still just a, a regional power. India is not there yet. Europe hasn't really come together. And, and you know, uh, the Soviet Union is, has collapsed. Russia is not, not back on the map. Um, and so this was the image that we believed would represent world power for decades to come. There was no alternate vision in sight. But it's precisely because of this, these, this new phase of globalization that we are in that the diagram of world power has changed so radically in such a short amount of time. Because again, the, 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 the Berlin Wall fell exactly 25 years ago. And in 25 years, I believe we've come to something that looks more like this. This is what I call the, the geopolitical marketplace. You could also just call it the map of globalization. But our maps are actually terrible. They only tell us where things are. Maps never tell us how things actually work. So to do that, you need something, uh, you know, a diagram of sorts. And so what I'm trying to show here is, first of all, as I said before, you know, every region is on the map, right? Every region matters today. And that wasn't always the case. Um, secondly, we have regionalism. Right? We have this growing density of interaction within regions. The European Union obviously is the foremost example of that. But around the world, wherever you go, you see more regionalism happening. I've recently relocated to Asia, where every day there's a new diplomatic agreement to try and tie countries closer together uh, to, to deepen their economic and political uh, relationships. But most importantly, there isn't one center in this diagram. Right? Everyone is doing business with everyone else. Washington is not in charge, London is not in charge, globalization in a way is in charge. And it is the cities in these regions, it is the infrastructure that connects those cities, it is the airlines, it is the undersea internet cables, it is the telecommunications, all of the ways in which uh, the different regions of the world are able to ever more seamlessly trade and engage with each other that is accelerating our shift towards this diagram of the world. And I think this is a robust structure. I think this is a decentralized picture of the world. It's a world in which it matters less what uh, you know, particular nation you are in than what city you might be in. Now, uh, I wanted to, to make a reference to Orwell, but because, of course, he came to Barcelona uh, in the mid-1930s to serve as a, as a partisan in the Spanish Civil War. He actually felt that the anarchists were in control of this city. Things have changed a little bit, I think, uh, in the, in the last, uh, last few decades. But the reason I, I bring up Orwell is, is not because of the, the, his... Um, his, um, his work about that period, the homage to Catalonia, but because of the book he wrote 10 years later, which of course is 1984. Now, all of you are familiar with what 1984 was about, but there was, there was, there was one uh, map uh, that, that sort of captures the, the structure of the world at the time. And the map was quite different from the one that I, I put up earlier, but it's one that we increasingly worry about becoming real today. This was Orwell's map. These were the warring, autarkic uh, superpowers, if you will, of, of that age, of 1984. The novel was, of course, set in, in Oceania, but Eurasia and East Asia were these powerful regional blocks that were um, uh, authoritarian, totalitarian in their territories as well, but warring and combating with each other over the spaces in between. And I, fear, I, I always fear that that is something that, that we should worry about. Geopolitics has certainly not gone away, and we see that every day when we look at what's happening in Ukraine. And indeed, in, in political science and international relations, we're very worried that globalization requires a, a very strong geopolitical anchor, because historically it has as well. 
I've just tried to present to you a, a diagram of globalization in which, I, and I, I admittedly, I said, no one is in charge, right? I said that the, the network takes over, in a way. That's a nice vision, but a lot of people will say, well, that's actually a very dangerous and a very bad idea. Uh, because historically, you had Pax Britannica and Pax Americana providing the stability which underpinned global trade and global exchange amongst those cities. And we've had peace, prosperity, and growth in the world economy during those periods. And when there has been hegemonic instability, there has been world war. And if geopolitical theories are correct, we might indeed be heading towards a World War III. It's certainly the case that we have multiple, very powerful uh, superpowers, if you will, that have very, very intense uh, relations with each other. So are we going to have a repeat of history? Are we going to have a World War III? Or is that view that cities naturally have, which is to trade, to exchange, because cities cannot be autarkic the way the empires of 1984 can, or will another model prevail? There is some hope. There is something different happening today than in previous periods. And I wanted to show that to you in this, in this manner. It is, uh, to my knowledge, never before been the case in history that, that humankind, that the countries of the world put together in terms of their federal budgets, spend more on anything than they do on defense, military, whether it's warships, submarines, nuclear weapons, and so forth. And yet something different is, has been happening since the end of the Cold War, and certainly in the last 10 years. And that is the volume of global infrastructure spending. And this data, that those, that those light colored blue bars, that is all of you, right? All of you who work on cities, because urbanization, urbanization particularly in Eurasia, everything from Europe across to China, is the driver of this massive growth. There is a leveling off that's happening in global defense spending. It has a lot to do with the US cutting back its spending. But if you look at the gap as it widens and widens, even if global defense spending were indeed to, to, to rise again, would it match the projections that we have around the demand for spending on urbanization, on transportation, on telecommunications, on sanitation, and so on and so on? Probably not. This is really a rupture, if you will, a really different kind of pattern than we've ever, ever seen before. And I wonder what it means. What does it mean for a world where we're worried about geopolitical tension and conflict, but we're spending more and more and more on building or, or rebuilding, as it were, much of the world? Because in fact, when the United Nations was um, founded in, in uh, 70, 70 years ago, it had 51 members. There were 70 countries in the world, but 50, 50 members. Today, as you know, there are 200 members of the United Nations. And so most countries in the world uh, have been born in just the last 70 years. So most of the world is post-colonial countries that really do need to spend a lot more on on building their infrastructure, on rebuilding themselves. And those are the, the mega cities, if you will, across Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and so forth. So we, we, I certainly expect this trend to continue in, the, in this gap. But again, will conflict disrupt it, or can we move into a new kind of pattern? And so I hope that what we'll do in a world that is, that is run by the agendas of cities, the need for cities to invest in infrastructure, and to continue to build themselves to house nine billion people, that we will not damage, destroy, undermine all of that in war, but that we might move towards a different kind of paradigm that, that I call tug-of-war. Tug-of-war is, of course, not new. Actually, it's the oldest sport in all of human history. Perhaps race, running, racing, or swimming might be older, but we have archaeological records as a team sport. Tug-of-war is the oldest team sport in all of history, about 8,000 years of history of tug-of-war. Uh, Chinese emperors, uh, the pharaohs of Egypt and others used tug-of-war to train their militaries, but of course, they didn't actually fight. This is a very interesting kind of sport, because even though it's incredibly intense and excruciatingly painful, there's no actual combat, right? You're not actually physically harming your opponent. You're fighting over something that connects you. You're fighting over the rope. And to me, that rope is a metaphor for the connectivity that we have today in the world economy, whether it's the supply chains, the trade, the investment, and so forth. And the more we spend on that infrastructure, the more we spend on supply chains, the more we spend on, on investment around the world, the, the probably the less we would want to see that destroyed or undermined, right? So, and yet we can still fight over it. We can still struggle over it in non-military ways, in very competitive ways, but ones that are less uh, violent. And that's what I think the, the, the model should be for the competition in a world of cities versus a competition in a world of empires, is that it's not war, but it's 
tug of war. This is a photo actually from the 1908 Olympic Games. The, the tug of war was an Olympic sport for four, um, four successive Olympics. Europeans always won, by the way. Um, it's not actually a new idea per se. Again, as I said, in times of peace and centuries of prosperity, we have had globalization, particularly across cities, uh, thriving. So I'm giving you a few examples. The Hanseatic League era, especially centered on Northern Europe uh, during the Middle Ages. I mentioned this is the sort of Venetian era of history, but of course it was a period when cities were the dominant actors on the European continent, and the Hanseatic League was a, a trading uh, a, a sort of association in the Baltic Sea and the North Sea. The Dutch Empire is fascinating to me because the Dutch focused uh, much less on territorial conquest than on setting up trade entrepots across from Latin America all the way to modern-day Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, and so forth. The British East India Company, there was certainly some amount, some degree of subjugation involved. I, I'm, I'm Indian originally, so I know this quite well. Uh, however, it was largely for centuries a commercial effort to expand, again, mercantile supply chains. The US at independence used classic, actually European-derived uh, import substitution policies to strengthen its economy and build its, uh, its urban production base. And now, of course, late 20th century China, using special economic zones to become the factory of the world. Now, let me ask anyone in this room, does anyone know how many nuclear weapons China has? Anyone? Don't see any hands going up. How did we measure superpower dumb? Uh, up until uh, 25 years ago. You know, we looked at how many nuclear weapons do you have? How many uh, ICBMs do you have? How many uh, nuclear submarines do you have? How many aircraft carriers? We don't seem to actually, uh, you know, no one in this room seems to care, but you would probably all agree that China is a superpower. And it became a superpower not through building its military. It became a superpower in this manner, by becoming the world's factory floor, by drawing in supply chains, by developing the economies of its coastal cities. And it certainly wants to stay that way, even as it does now invest in its military. But the tug-of-war approach came first. The military development came afterwards. And now, again, we are in this world of, um, of uh, the, these very, very significant cities. Now, you've all heard the statistic that there are 600 cities that are the, the real, uh, that constitute the majority of the world's economy. There's something else that's happening. It's not just 600 discrete cities, right? We have a limited amount of land surface area in the world. And we have a tremendous rate of urbanization, and we have had significant population growth. If you put that together with the infrastructures that we are investing in, what you get is a world, actually, that you could call urban archipelagos. Cities or city clusters, corridors, that are so large that they encompass many cities and, uh, and, 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 and tens of millions of people simultaneously. And you can see these forming everywhere. There, there's, uh, they go, I think, well beyond what I've put up here, but these are just some of them. And you can see the large concentration in Asia. Now, for anyone who's been in Silicon Valley, that's a good example, right? I-280 or 101 and the space in between is just one long, low-rise, um, uh, you know, sort of built-up corridor. Um, you know, when you, when you fly on a plane or when you look at a map that's on your wall, cities just look like these dots. But in reality, of course, as you know, there are these long gray patches of urbanization. And that's what I'm trying to capture here. Uh, if you've been to, uh, to Lagos and you see what they're doing with the light rail and, you're, and you see the expansion of Lagos and its, its suburbs moving westward, I think that Lagos will soon spread westward across four countries, across Togo and Benin to Abidjan and the Ivory Coast, and you will have one long you know, uh, Atlantic coastal urban archipelago of 50, 60 million people. And that is happening um, all around the world as, you, as we build these urban archipelagos. Now, these are, again, like these places and the dozens of others that are the real drivers and foundations of the world economy, uh, they are more, much more interested in tug of war than in war, right? Much more interested in connecting and trading and, um, and, uh, and building markets than they are in, in fighting. I want to hone in on a couple of these to, you know, the places where I find the most interesting infrastructure and connectivity uh, overcoming our traditional ideas around political boundaries. And I'm starting with the, the hardest example first because it's, it's China. Now, on this uh, photograph, on this, on, this, on this image, you have cities that belong to at least 
four different legal jurisdictions and status vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Beijing, right? Macau has a different relationship with Beijing than Hong Kong cer certainly does, as you all know, uh, which is different from Shenzhen, which was, uh, you know, the original special economic zone designated in 1979, and so forth. And yet what is happening is they're building this Pearl River Delta megacity across these completely different jurisdictions where, that are affected in, in some ways you know, quite notable legal boundaries. They are building this physical connectivity and they're building, they're using master planning to really seamlessly combine these high-speed rail bridges. If you look at the very bottom here, this bridge is set to open in the year 2016 that will connect Macau, Zhuhai to Hong Kong, cutting down the travel time across the lower part of the delta from four hours to about half an hour, right? And this is the way in which infrastructure brings cities together, even if they have completely different um, uh, legal uh, relationships with each other. And if you've ever gotten in a car last summer, uh, you know, I, I, I decided to just drive around the whole area. And, you know, at, at what point do you feel like you have really um, you know, moved very discreetly from one city to another city to another city. Of course, you know, it feels like it's just one large urban uh, area. And in fact, as if the Chinese economy were not large enough, the Pearl River Delta region in and of itself would be a member of the G20. Right? So it would probably replace, you know, Argentina or something uh, in, in the G20 if it were to have a separate seat at the table. Um, and this is how we should think about China. Because we, we tend to think of it as just a you know, very centralized, authoritarian state. This is an image from um, you know, McKinsey's study of the Chinese economy in which they really break it down into these 22 uh, mega city clusters. There is a lot more uh, devolution in China than people realize when it comes to allowing uh, these city clusters to develop their own you know, business plans, if you will, their own economic uh, strategies. And that's uh, increasingly what you see when you travel within these different clusters. And some of them, uh, such as the, um, uh, the, uh, the Qianyu region that connects Chengdu and Chongqing, that actually encompasses about 100 million people. So clearly we are in a phase where uh, just within one country, but certainly even in smaller countries than China, you have cities whose demographic weight, whose economic weight, far exceeds the weight of many uh, countries in the world. So that's yet more reason to believe that we are um, you know, entering this world of the, um, of the city-state, and that one country, even a, uh, again, a powerful empire like China, actually has many such city-states within it, if you think about it in these economic terms. And as I showed you on the previous map, much of this is concentrated in, in Asia, right? The mega-city development. And this is also because, as I said before, it's not just the population it's the, and, and the urbanization, it's the need for infrastructure investment to, to, uh, to put a roof over the heads of all of these people. And Asia, too, like other parts of the world, like Africa, is made up of many post-colonial countries that have been neglecting their infrastructure for a very long time. So now we get to, to a little bit to the fun part. Uh, because with, with one of my other hats on, uh, my, more of my political science uh, activist hat on, um, you know, I, I do believe that devolution, uh, devolution coming in many forms, one of which is the uh, inexorable concentration of people and economic weight in cities, but also the political devolution of the world since World War II is not something that's going to stop. It's something that's going to continue and continue. And the evidence of that is for one thing, as I mentioned earlier, that since, um, since the founding of the United Nations, we have tripled the number of countries. So even though uh, the United Nations in many ways tries to suppress uh, independence, uh, the Wilsonian vision uh, continues to triumph. And, and Woodrow Wilson, uh, the American president a century ago, supported uh, the right of self-determination of, of nations, and he, um, and he sought to include that in the, in the League of Nations. I learned yesterday uh, some, uh, uh, something that, that proves this argument. I learned that the group of leaders here in Catalan who are promoting an economic uh, agenda for, for an independent Catalonia call themselves the Colectivo Wilson. So there you go. Um, so secessionism, devolution, uh, whatever the case may be. Scotland was the referendum of uh, a couple of months ago. 
Uh, Catalonia has had its, uh, its non-binding referendum recently, but there's many other cases around the world of places that want to assert themselves to build their own connections to the world. This is not anti-globalization. This is about cities and city regions and provinces wanting to connect to the world on their own terms, to not have the interference of federal capitals, to become city regions unto themselves. And I think that will continue. And some of these will uh, be among the, those 600 economic pillars of the world economy. But any place that has a viable city, because there is no viable country that doesn't have a viable city, there are cities that are getting by even though they're in failed states, places like Karachi or places like Lagos. But a successful country has to have a successful city at a minimum uh, within it. And what these places want to do is to build because they have uh, a, an urban foundation that they can build on or they have natural resources and they can connect to the world economy. They too want to have their independence, but not uh, because, of, um, because of the desire to assert a tribal identity, but because of a desire to connect to the world on their own terms. So devolution, secessionism, the creation of new countries, actually advances this globalization of relations between city-states because they must rely on each other. They cannot be uh, autarkic. Then there's another phenomenon that I think is extremely important in promoting the globalization among cities, uh, the, the, the sort of cross-pollinization and so forth, and that is the rise of special economic zones, some of which I call info states, but I'll come to that. Now, special economic zones just begin with uh, this number on the bottom of the screen, 3,500 special economic zones in the world today. Um, Shenzhen was not the first special economic zone, right, uh, in, in the modern era. Uh, you can look at free ports, uh, that, you know, going back to ancient Athens. But uh, in the post-war period, Shannon, Ireland was the first modern special economic zone. And Shannon, Ireland um, made itself the place where aircraft had to land. Our, our before 747 planes, um, planes could not fly nonstop across the Atlantic. So they stopped in Shannon, Ireland for uh, refueling. That was back in the 1950s. So from the 1950s to today, we've created 3,500 special economic zones. And this is what happens when countries want to join globalization, when they want to attract supply chains and foreign investment, when they want to harness their natural resources through export processing zones, or in some cases when they want to uh, circumvent their uncontrollable urbanization and create a smart city for example. All of those are examples of special economic zones, and clearly there is a trend underway if you can go from one to 3,500 in a matter of about uh, 50 years. Now, they take many forms, but I think that it is, um, what we should look for is not just, not look to them as just a single industry unit, you know, a factory with dormitories. What's happened over time is that special economic zones become cities. They become living, breathing places. They become communities. You can see this happening uh, in India. You can see this happening in Vietnam and many other places. Can we use them? And I think that many of you that represent the technology companies or, or the banks or, or, or many other sectors should look at these as, uh, as, as, as uh, you know, interesting places to experiment with improved governance, with uh, citizen participation, with the efficient delivery of services, with new financial models, uh, because these are not, the, uh, as, uh, over time, these places will grow in size. They will become new dots on the map as they grow and grow and grow. Because, of course, countries or city-states or provinces need an economic model in order to survive. We have such massive amounts of municipal debt in the world today, across the world, whether it's in mature economies, in Europe, in the United States, and certainly in Asia. Uh, cities are, need to find their own new business models, and they do so by creating special economic zones, but they actually uh, create opportunities to have a new, biz a, a new governance system in which the public sector and the private sector uh, collaborate much more with each other and where the lines are a bit more blurred. And what this event to me represents in many ways is the place where uh, special economic zones smart cities, uh, info states as I call them, uh, you know, come together to learn, to share ideas. You know, that's why we, are, we celebrate the, uh, the lessons uh, from other cities that have been implemented in a place like Medellin. Uh, and we see that happening all over the world. And this is the new diplomacy of cities coming together and sharing knowledge. And it is much more useful for a city to come to an event like this than it is to necessarily attend a United Nations General Assembly meeting, for example, or something like that. And I think this is also part of that shift. So 
it actually is affecting our diplomacy. I'm start to, starting to come full circle to 5,000 years ago uh, because that was a time when, you know, again, the, the city and the state were effectively identical. Today what we find is that we are looking at the national level for leaders who have executive experience. And not all of the, the, the faces I put up here uh, have made the leap from mayor to head of state, though some of them have, some of them have not, some of them still might. But right now, there are about 10 uh, heads of state in the world who were previously mayors of cities. I expect that number to continue. When I travel to, to many of the cities that you come from, I see that the most respected politician uh, in your country is usually the mayor of the capital city, if he has been an effective executive. Uh, sometimes they call themselves CEO of the city. But clearly, at, at the national level, uh, we are looking for people who have been able to, in an urban world, govern an urban space. Uh, and to, to manage it effectively, to deliver services, um, uh, to, to, uh, to, to generate uh, new economic activity and so forth. And so I expect uh, more and more mayors to rise to that national level uh, and to make this an international issue. And that's already what we see happening. Now, um, one of the most important things that has to happen uh, as we move to this world of, of global cities is managing migration, because cities are becoming melting pots, right? They, again, they're trying to attract talent, they're trying to attract labor. And we live in a world of enormous growth in migration, not just to cities, but between cities. Uh, never before have we had, I'll uh, start from the bottom, you know, 250 million expatriates in the world, 250 million people, or, or some, some, some research puts the figure a lot higher, people living outside their country of origin. And traditionally, whereas we think of migration as people moving from south to north, right, from developing countries to developed countries, or from east to west, now we have flows in all directions. I give as one example uh, the data that LinkedIn has recently published, where they said, you know, the top five countries from which members of LinkedIn have physically left as a percentage of members in that country versus the top five countries that have gained those members is remarkable because the top five, well, I'm sorry that Spain is on the list. I just, just noticed that. <laughs> I didn't want to self-censor. Uh, but uh, so people are leaving Spain, but they're moving to places like the United Arab Emirates, Nigeria, South Africa, India, and Singapore. So we have completely new migration patterns in a world where cities have to demonstrate not only their economic viability and start to extend their political reach, but they have to manage diversity because we are the, a world of cities is also a world of these melting pots. So cities like Dubai, cities like city, Singapore, cities like London have uh, a more than 50% of their population, London a little bit less, but Dubai and Singapore, more than 50% of the population being foreign born. The more migration we have and the more urbanization we have and the more global trade and financial flows we have, the more we're going to be in a world of melting pot cities. And so managing, um, managing uh, diversity becomes an extremely important uh, criterion. Which brings me to the last point, and this is, um, you know, again, really coming full circle to uh, the age of city-states, which I said is not new, it's 5,000 years old, uh, the age of the Hanseatic League of the Middle Ages, five, 600 years ago, also not new, a world in which, in fact, cities were in charge, but not just in charge of themselves, but in, ch in charge of global politics, in charge of uh, the global trade and the global economy. It all happens in cities, it all happens because of cities, it is all driven by cities. So I was looking for a new word for this, my background is in diplomatic theory, and so I think that the diplomacy of cities should be called diplomacity, uh, and that we need to have more such uh, networks in which we pursue not just the traditional diplomacy between states, but the diplomacity between the cities that are the, uh, the pillars uh, of, the, uh, of this global network civilization that is coming together. I hope, of course, that Barcelona will continue to do its part to be a capital of this uh, global or digital Hanseatic League. And I just want to thank you so much for your time this morning. I look forward to, uh, to taking your questions if we have time. Thank you again. Muchas gracias. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was a very special treat for all of us, I'm sure. We have two microphones in the middle aisles here. If anybody has a question, please step forward. And uh, I'll also, as people are stepping forward, I'll take this time to remind you all that the next plenary session will be immediately following right here in this very same room. And for all of you with the smartphones that Parag mentioned, 
Um, please be tweeting and, and uh, using your social media. Remember the hashtag, um, Smart City Expo. I see we have somebody approaching. No. Do we have any questions? You've shocked them into silence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that can be a good thing sometimes. <laughs> well, Parag, listen, we thank you so very much thank for you. your, your, your words this morning, your insights into globalization and, and the impacts it will have and the opportunities for cities to really uh, make our way in the world. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks, Please join me in thanking Parag. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh,